Good evening. I'm going to call the Thursday, June 16th uh, business meeting of Narwick Borough Council to order. Uh, let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Troy's board, can you leave us in that Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, no, they're down the admin office. Uh, so all right, so we're hopeful that as of next week, we'll continue to be in low transmission and we'll be able to uh, uh, return to masks optional. As long as possible. I really hope that the blue transmission is stay down. Alright, so that's taken care of. No? No, I thought I did. We'll do that after we call the roll. Okay. Uh, so. Alright, so we'll call the roll. Uh, Council President Fred Bush. Here. Council Vice President Michelle Panopoulos. Here. Council Member Barbara Fortner. Here. Council Member Rob McGrady. Council Member Cindy Ripper. Here. Council Member Bob Weisberg. Here. Council Member Ira Winston. Mayor Andrea Deutsch. All right. Um, let's move on to considering any agenda items or changes. Sorry, right. did you have agenda items or changes for us? Uh, all right, seeing no uh, agenda items or changes, uh, I do have uh, a comment. This was a thank you note that was handed to me uh, as I uh, came into Borough Hall. It says, on behalf of the Narbury Skaters, uh, I would like to thank you guys for our skate park. So far, it has been uh, doing great, and I haven't had any complaints. I hope the skate park sticks around, and uh, I hope it continues to benefit the community. Uh, thanks, Harry Quick. Nice. Here was uh, one of the uh, inspirations for the you know, help get this going. So, thank you. <laughs> All right. Mayor Deutsch is unfortunately uh, uh, caught up in some personal business, so. Let us move on to public comments. Uh, I'm just going to stick around with the public comment in the room because Samantha is otherwise occupied right now. All right. Mr. Spear, do you have any public comment? Don't worry. Uh, from Ms. Gallagher to Port Sabine. Uh, last meeting, I asked about the finances of 201 and how they reported $250,000 income and the net income and the $350,000 cost of running the building will affect our president's financial. Craig, you told me to uh, go to the website. I have, and my, my, my comment is I wanted to comment about it and talk about it, but it was shut down, which is going to be unfortunate because. We need to have dialogue about this. The residents of Norfolk need to have dialogue, not just get a look at the website. So realistically, and I, I mentioned this at that, uh, the first meeting, if the building is reported a negative income that costs taxpayers money, why can't it be a park reporter reporter? We will be saving money. Now, Bob, you say that the building needs to make money, and Michelle says the property has to realize uh, the lost revenue. But besides the fact that it's been said that the building loses money, We'd like to know, I'd like to know, the residents would like to know how much money you need to get from that building, from that development, because that's really important to know. If you look at the service numbers, if the building makes 5% of the borough budget, 250000 you divide it by 1,400 households in Dartford, that would only be a tax increase of less than $200. And 
And conversely, if the building actually loses money, as you have said it does, then if it loses that hundred thousand dollars, so it'd be a three hundred fifty thousand dollar net loss, then we'd save two hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, into our tax bills. So my question is, have you asked the, the public in general what they think about a tax increase versus a tax savings? What a benefit the loss would be? Um, when the survey was done several years ago, most respondents said they want to park, but the fewest respondents said they wanted income generation to lower taxes as their option of choice. So, and also to give a perspective, the big Elm building brings in $30,000 of tax revenue to the borough. If you need to get, or you choose to need $250,000 from that property, you're going to need to build eight buildings that size to get $250,000 of income. I mean, I'm just pulling numbers that I see because we're not having any conversation about it. It is me just talking, looking at numbers, but not having any engagement. Um, I had a conversation with Amanda Kelly's office, and I was told that, quote, I, Amanda Kelly's office, had a long conversation with Robert Mayer, who assured me there are no plans to actually finalize the 201, and they are considering several proposals, unquote. The question is, what are the proposals? And where are the proposals? What is the goal? You haven't communicated with the residents of Narborough what the goal is. We need public meetings so we can talk about what the goals is of council versus what the goals is of the community. And instead of having it being a dividing, a divisive conversation, have it be a uniting conversation so we can work together. Right. It's our tax money we're spending. So I want to know. Personally, and my neighbors want to know how this money is being spent Thank and you, what our priority is. So, 201 is Carol, about your time value. Has expired. What? Your time has expired. One sentence. 201 is about value. What is the value to the neighborhood of open space versus the value of development? And that's a question that needs well, to be. That was one sentence. Thank you. Pardon me? That was one sentence. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, do you have a public comment? Sure, Dennis Rose, uh, 244 Dudley Avenue. First of all, I want to thank the borough. I think the purchase of the Elmwood property is an excellent idea, it's excellent open space. It's perfect for what's, what that property can be used for and what it, what it does for the borough. So I think that's excellent. I think it's also excellent that the borough has made clear that their plan, as far as I can be looking at the minutes, never been an interest in getting rid of Sabine Park. So when I see these signs that say, say Sabine Park, I go, whoa, what's that all about? Then I can, you know, sort of like uh, John Prime, the old song, you know, what the big print gives the small print take it away. In this case, the small print tells us a little bit more that they're talking about expanding. That might be the right thing. I don't know. I think, but I do think it's important that it be looked at in a, in a holistic way, finances, we look at the parks, what do we have? We have the, the great Narbeth Park, but now we have a skate park, uh, which is looks like it's getting a lot of good use, and it looks kind of neat, but you know, what is it for the gray hairs that they can use? Where's the pickleball, where's the tennis courts? Maybe we can do that, maybe we can't, maybe it can all be fit down our Narbeth Park, but before you do anything with the property up at Sabai, because I saw one letter that said one thing to do is the building's bad, just get rid of it, and then we'll figure things out. That's the worst thing to do when you come to zoning issues. One of the things I saw to say, say the web, say my website is, hey, send in your money for lawyers. They're getting ready. I mean, if they don't get what they want, whatever that exactly is, it may be the best thing is open, flat out open space. I don't know. But I do think the best thing to do is to have a comprehensive, view of all the issues, finances, what kind of uses they can have, and, and where those uses can be. It might be great to have tennis and, and skateboard up at Sabine. Maybe not. It might be good to have it down at the uh, Narvik Park. Maybe not. I don't know. Great to start with buying the open space in Elmwood. That was the craziest possible idea of building something there. That would have been killing people back out of their driveways. So that was great. Uh, I think the zoning that you've got planned and passed with regard to Montgomery Avenue. I saw that, I think that's a good plan. As far as I understand it anyway, as I read it, I think that's a, a good thing. But we've got a 
a lot of building in this town. I've been in here for 34, 35 years. And before that, I've lived here in the park a couple of years. Uh, we've got a lot of park usage issues. We've got bike paths that people want to have. We have a bridge that needs to be re redone. It might be best to kind of step back and see what the big plan is before we take and do any one thing with any one of those items. That, to me, makes the most sense. Uh, I also would uh, think, I know that the, the thought of having a committee to look at things, is but they're going to be appointed from committees that are already uh, you know, burdened, frankly, with all the work to do. You might want to put it out there. I mean, I'd be willing to search and volunteer my time. I'm not saying I'm any expert in any of that stuff, but I would be more than willing to step on and see the help. I don't have an agenda. I don't have a one thing except I would like it studied before we do things because there's so many changes that have been going on in the world. And, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong Democrat, so I, I like what we've had come into this world to develop. But I think we need to step back just a bit and cautiously move forward. That's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's it for folks in the room. Samantha, if you can. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so our usual uh, process here for Zoom, anyone can either use the raise hand function on Zoom or literally raise your hand. I'll uh, call on you. You'll get a prompt on your screen where you can unmute, and then you're welcome to make your uh, three-minute uh, public comment. All right. Looks like uh, the first hand I see raised is Mr. Lawrence Goldberg. Thank you. Lawrence Goldberg, 200 Sabine Avenue. I'm going to talk about data-driven decision-making tonight. Uh, you've heard a lot about uh, feelings and emotions and desires, but let's give you some data. So <clears throat> the 201, um, you've talked about development. You've talked about the possibility of uh, putting a daycare in there and dense housing um, that would uh, serve a very tiny uh, percentage of the population. But now it seems like the, the conversation has shifted to revenue. And I've heard several board uh, council members mention revenue. So I'm going to take a look at revenue. The first piece of data I want to look at is the survey that's published, that you guys did, that's published on your website. Um, for 10 items, dead last, um, and this, this is astounding to me, but a, a unifying dead last is revenue. So what the community and the taxpayers and the folks that put you guys in office to represent us say is that's the least important thing to us, 10 out of 10, for, to do with that site. So just keep that in mind. When you're talking about you're acting like it's the first most important thing, we've told you in the survey that you did, it was the least most important, important thing. I'd also like to point out that before the survey was even done, Sean Metric, the previous borough manager, uh, prepared a memo that mentioned dense development. So before you even asked us what we wanted, there was, there was an RFP um, that mentioned dense development. I have a copy of that um, that I got through a right to know request. So it's clear that the, that the, uh, the borough had some ideas on where they want to go with this. In any case, in 2018, KCBA did a study and it calls for about $4.75 million in repairs and upgrades necessary to maintain the building. And that was based on a 2% inflation rate, which we all know now was way underestimated. So what I did was I actually went online and looked at the real inflation rate. So 4.75 million uh, today's dollars, assuming the inflation rate wasn't higher for construction, which it probably would be, would be about $5.5 million. So that property would take 5.5 million to upgrade and maintain properly um, in, in the coming years. You guys have quoted, I've heard $240,000, I've heard $250,000. I looked at the, the data on your website and it says that as of last year, it was $231,000 of revenue. It was even, even less for the first quarter of this year, but let's take the figure 231,000. If you take 231,000, multiply it out by 18 years and, you, and, sub, and as the revenue, subtract from that the 5.5 million that you need to do in upgrades, you come up with a deficit of one35 $4 million. So there is no revenue from that building. It would save the taxpayers $1.34 million plus a month to down. So, the, so time has expired. You need to be clear about what you're talking about. The building brings in no revenue. It costs us $1.34 million 
And I believe the estimate you have for tearing it down is 1.24 or 1.25. So it pays pay for it. It's it's a hundred thousand dollars approximately more to remove. Yes. Your time has expired. Thank you. All right. The next hand I see raised is Mr. David uh, Burdow. Hi, uh, good evening, Council. Um, I just want to uh, take this opportunity to thank um, you for allowing for the uh, pilot skate park program that we have uh, downtown in, uh, in the park. Uh, it seems to be getting off to a, a great start, a success. There's, it's being used a lot. And uh, my only question was I wanted to see if Council would be open and open, excuse me, to extending the hours past seven o'clock. Uh, there's a there are a lot of people that are using it. Um, it doesn't seem to be too loud. And it was just, I know it's, uh, this is relatively new, uh, but there's only, you know, the days will start getting shorter. So I'd like just to see if we could extend those hours so people could use it uh, past seven o'clock. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that looks like it for public comments. Um, in response to the questions about the finances at 201 Save this is um, what's driven us to thinking about change is because, uh, as Lawrence has pointed out, uh, in the long run, the current uh, situation is financially unsustainable for the borough. In the short run, uh, 201 Save is still cash flow positive for the borough. Um, we are still making money uh, at the moment. Uh, we are not costing the taxpayers money at the moment by maintaining the setup as it is, but were we to do all the repairs that have been identified, then it would be financially unsustainable. So that is the, um, the issue that we're facing, and that's what's uh, brought us to uh, consider um, all these other options, is because the current setup is financially unsustainable. Um, all right, let's move on to the consent agenda. Someone like to make a motion uh, regarding the consent agenda? Someone like to make a motion on the consent agenda? I, I move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Right. Is there any discussion of the consent agenda? All right. Um, all those in favor of passing the items on the consent agenda, Let's raise your hands. Okay, I see five yeses. Frank, can I ask a question? I'm uh, sorry, I know that you just asked about any additions to the agenda, but given Mr. Berto's comment, which I agree with, and I would hate to wait until our next meeting, is it possible that this is not a legal document? Could we perhaps amend the agenda to ask to include that skate park time? My view on that is that that would be something that would not require board action formally change. So as a result of that, it wouldn't even need to be on the agenda. So it could be something that could be added to the agenda for consideration if the council so wanted, just as if the manager wanted to reset times, she could do that as well. So if it's something for discussion and then consensus, if the council so wanted to, it could be added. Could I request that we add that in new business then? Sure. So uh, is there a second to this motion to I'll add uh, to new business? All right. Although I think we put it under open. Oh, I guess it is okay. <laughs> Where? Do you want to re revise okay. your motion to put it under uh, I move to add a department on skate park time under old business at 12 D. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All right, so we're voting to add the skate park time to you know, old business as 12D. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, 12D. Okay, uh, let's move on to action items. Uh, 9A. 9A, I need the Borough Council approve the consent agenda. No, 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 no.
I move the consideration of resolution 2022-14 for the meeting reporting policy. A second. Okay. Discussion. <clears throat> So I'm going to apologize a little bit in advance tonight. Um, for everyone who, I think everyone here pretty much knows, but just so the public knows, I actually had COVID uh, last week, and I'm still uh, it's a little harder for me to talk than usual. Um, so I'm actually going to defer to the solicitor as well as uh, council member records to talk about some of the discussion and thought process on this proposal. So I know that it's been a goal of council ever since each individual member has come on the council to try to increase and maintain transparency of the borough of Narberth as, as much as they possibly can. The borough of Narberth agencies under the law is not just council, but it's also those representative bodies of council, those citizens boards, those commissions, those bodies that make whose duty it is to make recommendations to council. So council, can, council sorry, under the Sunshine Act, they are deemed to be agencies that are required to have public meetings, pre-advertised, um, open to the public, take public comment, uh, must have a quorum present in order to do business, uh, just as borough council is. So it's my understanding that in order to expand the transparency of the borough business, uh, there is a desire to uh, require that all of these agencies of council so again the commissions the councils um, that are out there that are created uh, by borough council uh, to have their meetings videotaped just as this meeting is videotaped uh, in order to uh, have those videos be made available uh, or uh, published uh, either or to the public uh, so it would require according to this resolution uh, it would require that those meetings be videotaped in a manner that the agency business and deliberations can be seen and heard so the public's in a position to know exactly what goes into you know, the sausage making of the decisions that eventually come before council. Uh, and then those records, uh, those uh, videos be uh, transferred to the borough office uh, for publication or retention in line with the borough's record retention policies. So if council would like to move forward with that policy of having those agency videos recorded, uh, this resolution would provide that direction. I think the only context to add from FNA is that we obviously wholly support this and also approved um, some nominal spending on any uh, equipment that would be necessary for folks to have, which is very small and limited. Um, we also, it's something that we'll talk about next meeting, but FNA has discussed then when we, um, do our volunteer application, which is that new process for going on any boards or commissions, but there's also a kind of a training module where you read or watch something, uh, where you understand what the sunshine rules are, that you understand the expectations that you're recording and whatnot, and you're kind of signing off that, that you understand and you agree to comply with these expectations and rules. So this is a great thing. Yes. And the expectation would be people would be using this camera, right? They'd be this is the borough's mm -hmm. property, so we use it again for boards and commissions as well. Mm -hmm. What will happen if a board and commission is meeting at the same time and this council or two boards and commissions are meeting at the same time? Mm -hmm. um, that was not thought about. Um, I so think you just have to discuss that you can't do that. that. <laughs> well, 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 you can record it, but it's a piece of technology. That we can support. I mean, yeah. We are, but I, I'm glad to hear that we, we've approved some, some budget for this. Absolutely. We're going to give support. Yeah, they're and necessary to support. We're not expecting someone to come in and use their personal laptop for a recording, for example. Okay. That's all. Okay. Could I just add so, one other? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I was just going to say one other thing. Obviously, um, our current record retention policy doesn't address these video meetings and so that that is something that will that, like that's a next step is that that'll, that'll happen that and, and and i think what um will part of why i support this so much is that i think this is we're going to be hosting these I want to remember, on the borough's website so that the civic association will be like oh if they have to be on our youtube channel because that's the only place they are um, this is really saying, hey, no, this is the borough's responsibility to have these out there for everyone. So, as much as we love what the Civic Association has done, they shouldn't feel like they have to continue to do this. Yeah, 
Thank you for bringing that's a strong word. Sorry, I forgot that. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> so, what would we put in? Well, I guess that's a separate policy. It's the records policy. Sure. So, I guess the, the, the records policy will, if it's not addressed as part of this no. resolution, we'll have to figure that out uh, going forward, I guess. Yeah, because right now, <clears throat> right now the borough uh, just basically has adopted the state's record retention policy. Um, which doesn't cover video recordings, it only covers paper records. Okay. So we would need to just to supplement that with something for video recordings, which if council approves this resolution, staff could relatively quickly put that together. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so we're going to vote on resolution 2022-14 uh, for meeting recording policy. All those uh, in favor of the resolution? Okay, five. Well, yeah, I am in favor. I just there was something I was going to say, but I covered it. I just I um, there may be times when video recording is just not possible. The technology is just not available. Things are not working. I, I would I mean, I, maybe too late. We just voted through this, but I would suggest that in, in a situation like that, we might want to prepare our committee chairs to be prepared to create an audio recording um, as the next best alternative which can really be an acceptable way to know what happened at the meeting, so. Um, Feel free to jump in before I call for the vote. I'm sorry, I was I was going to and then it just kind of. Yeah. I, I wonder if that's something that we can put that doesn't have to be in the resolution, but probably mm -hmm. part of the volunteer training form, like you agree to. Um, now, I'm about to pull out Robert Schulz of order. I mean, yeah, we can't we can really discuss this. Okay, no, no, I mean, I, we, I, mean I almost would offer that I think we should actually make a motion to, uh, I forget the language, Rich Honor, you know, reconsider the motion. I don't know if that's right. Um, and, then, and then do a motion where we have that amendment to the, uh, to the resolution. Sure, and again, this is just a resolution, it's not an ordinance, so the, the formalities uh, are, aren't as important uh, as the council would like to do. This is more of a, a setting forth of what your intentions and desires and wants would be. There's no violation, there's no penalty for, for failing sure. to do this. But oh, I think it is clear, the council should clearly set forth what they'd like to see happen. All right, so someone should move to reopen the discussion or to, I uh, to reconsider either way. I move to reopen the discussion on resolution 20, uh, 2214 for consideration. Second. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Are you all those in favor of reopening discussion? Okay. So we're back to discussing this. Uh, say something? Because this, this is a question that came up um, when we with just a lot of thoughts about how our meeting recording is done, how do we have a backup plan? And this is something that, um, you know, it's like this idea of having a, a cheat sheet that tells people how to use the owl and the computer and to get their meeting recorded. And couldn't that, as part of that, have, and if for some reason the owl is Absolutely. causing you problems, here's what you do. Yeah. Does the resolution really have to say that? Uh, because that seems like that's way more detailed than you need to have in the resolution. I don't think so. I think no. if we simply struck video from that shall be video recorded, shall be recorded in a manner consistent with the instructions put forward by, you know, for yeah. our administrator and, yeah. you know, in a manner that the business and deliberations can be seen and or heard. Okay. Okay. So if we can make a motion to, yeah. well, why don't you to, amend? to do exactly what okay. said. So I move to amend the, the resolution 2022-14 um, such that in the second paragraph at the top of the second page, uh, now therefore be it resolved, um, we strike the word video before recorded, shall be, so to make it read, shall be recorded in a manner consistent with the instructions provided by the Borough Administration. Um, and, in, and in a manner that agency business and deliberations can be seen and or heard. Does that work? There, there's also the word video in the title. Exactly. And, and, I, and okay. I placed it there because I believe the idea was that you, you would not want a commission to default to just an audio recording of video recordings. Sorry? Perfect. My understanding was that you would, you would 
wanted the video. We do. Primarily. It's just really simple. I don't want a, a committee chair to say, oh my God, the internet went down. I have to cancel my meeting. Right. I want them to understand we can have a plan B that's acceptable in that kind of situation. Because like you need internet access here. We could pull out a tape recorder, like a digital recorder, right. and still conduct business and have reasonable transparency. Okay. I just didn't want that situation to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I, right. I just think we just made this pursuant to the instructions that are given by the administration and then giving up what yeah. covered. Right, so it would be the, the word video and by the line and the provisions. Yeah, like I'm the, sorry. Yeah. 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 I could just see that happening. You know, somebody saying, oh my god, the video won't work and I have to do this. We have to cancel the meeting. Right. That would be a shame. That would be right. a loss. Okay, so if we just remove the word video from the right. thing, that should do it. It just, it just We'll say it will be recorded. Yeah. shall be recorded. Mm -hmm. <coughs> is that, is that uh, satisfying? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think as long as we put in the pursuant to the instructions provided by the borough administration, and then, you know, the office will provide instructions that say, you know, this is how you record the meetings. Right. Record it with the owl in this way and that way. Right. Barring that, this is an alternative if you're not able to get that technology right. to work. So why don't you, sorry, Barbara? I noticed That's video is also in the second paragraph on the second page. Yeah. So yes. video recording, in case you haven't noticed that. <coughs> I don't think it appears anywhere else. It's not jumping out of anywhere. All right. So you want to try to put all this together in, in one uh, in one statement so we can vote on it? Um, if I may, actually. I mean, I know I can't actually make a motion, but I'll say something if someone wants to go with that. Great. Uh, so council would approve the resolution with amendments that the word video, all uh, instances of the word video would be removed and a sentence would be added uh, after the words public viewing or inspection that says uh, in a manner pursuant to instructions from borough administration. Someone like to make that motion? Is that Michelle? Is that uh... yeah? I, I, I did, where where did you say that? I, mean, I can't repeat uh, Following the phrase public viewing or inspection. Oh, okay. Great. So Do you want me to Well, that's that? in the whereas. We want to put it in the, we can't really put it in the I would put it in the whereas. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, should it be in the now, therefore, be a result? Uh, that was the idea. idea. Yeah. Um, okay, so I moved that. <laughs> Resolution 2022-14 be amended to strike all uses of the word video and to add uh, suggested review. Yeah, after the phrase can be seen and heard and in a manner consistent with instructions and in a manner consistent with and, and pursuant to instructions provided by the borough administration okay? and pursuant okay. to instructions provided by the borough administration. Is there a second? There? Second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any discussion? All right. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment to this resolution? Okay. Amendment passes. All right. Now we need to vote on the resolution again, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Do we need to vote on the resolution again? Oh, I think That's we just did it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, Robert's rules of work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move on to 9B. I move the Borough Council adopt Resolution 2022-15 for agreement of sale for three omelets. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Walker, do you want to? Yes, as you may recall, this was on Council's agenda uh, last month in May for this table because the agreement was still being drafted, negotiated with the seller uh, as Borough, and it's now reached the final form that's been approved by my office, uh, it's been approved by the seller. Uh, as Council knows, uh, Council has proposed to purchase the, uh, the undeveloped portion of 3 Elmwood uh, that was subject to a land development application for the borough. Uh, there was uh, approval granted by Council uh, to proceed with that purchase uh, and proceed with uh, applying for a grant application uh, that would cover 50% of the purchase of the property of 
this agreement of sale is contingent upon the borough receiving that grant in order for us to be compelled to go forward with the purchase for a total of 1.1 million of the purchase price. Uh, there's still a condition that it, it needs to be appraised, it needs to be appraised for that amount. So if this is passed tonight, the borough will need to take steps. Uh, I'll work with the borough manager to, to arrange for the necessary appraisals. Uh, that would also be necessary for that grant. Uh, but even if that grant did not come through, uh, if the money was still there and so decided by Borough Council, Borough Council could still elect to go through with this purchase as long as the closing uh, is timely. Um, that is the, the biggest contingency of the property. Uh, it's an undeveloped parcel. I think everyone's familiar with it. So although we have the right to inspect, there isn't really anything get into to inspect the property line uh, would be down the middle of the creek which is where it was being proposed originally on the plan to be subdivided so again it would be a situation where borough would have to uh, subdivide uh, granting self-subdivision rights to, to divide that parcel off uh, the closing date uh, is in line with the expected timeline uh, with with, uh, with any grant receipts if that grant was to be awarded. Um, so that, that works as well. Um, we're hopeful that that grant comes through for the property. Uh, there is language in here that says that the seller is not giving up any of their rights to their current land development plan. So I believe there was a question saying, well, what happens if this, this falls apart? Well, then I think we're in the same situation uh, that we were in before. As Borough Council may recall, uh, there was a plan. Uh, that plan was uh, voted on to be denied by Council. They have appellate rights to, to appeal our denials. Um, they, they are preserving those rights uh, in any type of litigation that's, that, that, that could be made under, um, that could have been made before. That's kind of being frozen by this, with the hopes of both parties, they will amicably resolve. So if council does approve this, this side would be uh, signed. It would then be presented to the seller for a counter signature. And then we have an agreement of sale to proceed with the appraisal. And hopefully we'll then be uh, lining up to hopefully get the grant funding. And hopefully everything would uh, work for us successfully. OK, so you mentioned subdivision. Now, the borough is not, if we were to buy this property, we would not be subdividing the, uh, the portion that we would be purchasing. Right. You're just talking about where the current house is, subdividing the lot where the current homeowner is. Correct. It would, it would, it would not be part of the purchase. Correct. Not, it wouldn't be the four lots that were originally proposed. It would just be essentially one line. So that all of the open space on the one side of, of the creek would then become the borough property. Borough, the borough is not purchasing the improved section with, with the house. Just wanted to clarify for members of the public. I think we're, we're all clear. Oh. Okay, that's question now. I just Please. this is I guess it's um I understood that when the developer was going to purchase the property from the owner that, that they would put the property line down the center line of the creek. But I guess I'm just absorbing and reflecting on the fact that our purchase would be the same parcel and I'm I guess I'm if we if it's not too late for us to think on that, I'd like to propose that we Really reconsider that line and make it the full, really, the creek bed itself because it's a sensitive creek bed. And if, you know, if we are going to restore it properly, we're going to want to be able to do both sides. And we might, we might never get the cooperation of the property owner to do it that way. The, um, and so I'm just, you know, and it might be too late. It's maybe that the, the horse already left the line. It, it, I think that that would delay the process significantly I mean, based upon having the, the property. I know that there are improvements pretty close to that creek property. I do know there were discussions with the seller um, that of, of entering into easements and that that current property owner on, on that side would be open to the idea of entering into conservation easements uh, that would still be their property, okay. but it would be conserved along that creek for access to maintain that. Now to be clear, that's not part of this agreement. Yeah. 
and, and all I can represent is that they have told us that they would be amenable to, to providing it for, for that reason. And I had that thought that perhaps not, you know, another conservation organization outside the borough might want to create an easement that would include both parties in the future, in a future time. Yeah, probably, so, probably the easement would work better for them. Again, it would be public property. I'm sure they would like to have sure. the public on yeah. their side. But sure. if there is an easement for the purposes of conservation and maintaining the banks, okay. that probably is more needed. Thank you. And give the borough what, what they're looking for. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, the resolution is uh, the agreement of sale uh, for three Elmwood. All those in favor? Okay. Motion passes. Uh, move on to. 9C. Okay. I move that um, Borough Council consider for approval ordinance number 1046 for municipal towing and municipal owned parking lots. And we Is there a second? That's right. I need a second. Sorry. Okay. There's a second. Big so, so we've had a lot of conversations about this. Do you just want to, John, let us know where we are at this point with this? Sure. I mean, this is the same ordinance that was before the borough um, at the last meeting. Um, it hasn't been changed substantively. It has been advertised uh, for tonight uh, in the Mainline Times at the uh, June 5th hearing and provided to the law library as required for, for all, all ordinances. Um, again, this, this borough, uh, sorry, this ordinance uh, does two things. The first, it, it sets up the ability for the borough to address uh, abandoned or uh, unauthorized cars that are parking on the borough's own property. Uh, that's how this conversation started. And it also sets up the opportunity to create a program to register and to permit certain cars on the borough property and parking lots. It doesn't have that system in, but it gives council that ability to, to establish that system. Uh, through that process, we came word of the borough that well, we really don't have a, a way to get cars off of the property if they weren't allowed to be there. Uh, many of our surrounding municipalities have a, a towing and impounding ordinance, which gives uh, municipalities the ability to take action to remove those vehicles. This ordinance is really based off of the same that other municipalities have, uh, which allows to remove disabled vehicles uh, and uh, illegally parked vehicles uh, and vehicles that are uh, on uh, borough property. There, there is notice, I believe the intent was to have it in line with the current operations that the police are following right now. So it should not actually make any changes. Uh, much of the ordinance is really regarding trying to control and to do background checks and to certify those people that Borough is inviting into the borough to do the borough's work in the towing and the impounding to make sure that it's just you know, not a guy with a truck who's not going to take care of the property once it's in their possession. Uh, so again, it, it is a um, should not have a practical change from the borough's operations, but it does codify uh, what needs to be done in order to make everything uh, orderly. Sure. Anyone uh, have questions or comments? This has come before council several times. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the motion is to approve ordinance 1046 for municipal towing and municipal owned parking. All those in favor? Okay, motion passes. Uh, 9D, building codes. Um, I move the borough council adopt ordinance number 1047 upgrade building codes from 2015 to 2018. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, all right. Uh, Is there discussion? So this is a, an ordinance that, that simply follows along with what Pennsylvania law would require us to do. Uh, most municipalities in Pennsylvania and throughout the Commonwealth are called opt-in municipalities who have decided to uh, enforce the International Building Code. 
revenue. So the Commonwealth uh, previously had the 2015 building code applicable. Now they've changed and have gone to the 2018 version of the code and we're mandating that municipalities are opting in to also follow the 2018. Um, this ordinance does that. This ordinance also uh, makes slight changes based upon change between 2015 and 18 to change the sections uh, that are cited to. Um, but I don't believe there are any real substantive changes related to the, to the building codes being made. And again, this would be the, uh, the building codes, the fire codes, um, probably the two most that will, will come up. Um, certainly, uh, Kevin Walsh is one of the better experts in the area on, on, on codes with, with, with their keys, and he recommends that this be done, and this is something other municipalities are doing as well. All right. I see no questions here. Uh, let's see the question is to uh, approve Ordinance 1047 to update the building codes from 2015 to 2018. All those in favor? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on to 9E. I move that our council adopt ordinance 1048 for 5A and 5B regulated uses. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So uh, I'm going to treat this ordinance much like a hearing because it is a zoning ordinance change. So uh, for the record, I believe there should be some additional public comment if desired. Uh, but this ordinance was advertised in the Mainline Times on May 29th and June 5th, 2022. Uh, it was submitted twice to both of the planning commissions. Uh, but the most recent time, it was submitted to both on May 16th, 2017, uh, and was subsequently reviewed at uh, their meetings and are both in favor of the ordinance. The reason for the resubmission is that the County Planning Commission uh, had some additional recommendations that they, they wanted to, to make. Council believed that it was a good recommendation and they wanted to incorporate those into a revised ordinance uh, that prompted the resubmission. Uh, that resubmitted ordinance was also submitted to the Law Library of Montgomery County on May 31st, 2022. Uh, so this is an ordinance that takes um, some the uses that may be more adult uses, some more undesirable uses, the, the type of uses that you wouldn't uh, consider more family friendly uses. Um, and moves them to the 5B district and not in the 5A district. Uh, one of the more recent changes was having uh, certain adult uses have a 500 foot buffer from churches, playgrounds. Um, it, under the, the law, zoning law, you have to have them somewhere uh, and they have to be a viable area. And Montgomery Avenue certainly seems to be a viable area for these commercial uses. Um, so unless it's one of those commercial uses that are set up there, uh, otherwise the, the current uses uh, will remain. If there is a use right now um, that is grandfathered in, we can't kick anyone out. Uh, but uh, if someone comes in to try to do one of these uses, it's identified as one of these uses, um, they, the, our, our zero zoning officer would not be able to issue any zoning permit to the not proper for this one. All right. So I believe we need to reopen public comment for this issue only. Correct. So if anybody has, uh, if any members of the public have comments on this ordinance for the regulated uses in 5A and 5B. I did make a comment earlier. I thought that it was uh, you could give your name and address. way to, to address these issues. If you could give your name and address again. Dennis Brogan, 244 WF. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, uh, same process as usual. If you'd like to make a comment solely related to this ordinance, uh, please raise your hand virtually or physically. I see uh, Carol Marie's hand raised. I'm sorry, I had to leave the meeting because I just couldn't hear anybody. I figured I could hear better with headphones in. Uh, my question is, with the grandfathered clause, can the smoke shop in the center of town become a dispensary based on the grandfathering in of an existing business? I would say no. Um, it, 
particularly in order to become a dispensary, you would have to have a, a, a licensing process. Uh, and both the smoke shops, the tobacco store, however it's defined, is defined as a separate, different use than a marijuana dispensary. So that would be a change of use, and since it would be a change of use, it would not be grandfathered in. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Murray. Okay, I don't see any more comment uh, online. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so, back to us. Any, uh, dis uh, sorry, do we have discussion during the hearing or do we close the hearing first? You, you could have discussions or questions at this point in time, wise Anybody on council have questions or discussion? All right. So at that point, you would close the hearing and now this ordinance would be in a position for council uh, to be voted on. So decide. Okay. All right. I still see no discussion. Uh, so the motion is to approve ordinance 1048 for 5A and 5B regulated uses. All those in favor? Okay, motion passes. Let's move on to 9F. Um, I move for consideration of the purchase of public works truck and snow equipment. Second. Second. Second by the city. Okay. Um, Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. If I start like coughing, feel free to jump in. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, so the purpose of this item is uh, with our public works manager, the infrastructure committee discussed uh, over the past season uh, our you know the borough how the borough handled uh, the snow events that we faced, and our public works manager recommended to us that if they were able to get two pieces of equipment in particular, uh, one being a particular type of snow uh, plow attachment, uh, the other being an automatic um, uh, broom device, and then the third being a um, spreader. Yeah, thank you. A spreader that would allow us to make use of uh, calcium carbonate as well as calcium chloride, I'm sorry, as well as uh, just regular sodium chloride brine. Those would all be things that, the last one in particular, I mean, would be better for the environment. We'd be able to use less salt. We'd be more effective in clearing snow and ice from our roadways. Uh, we'd potentially be able to save staff time involved through the use of better equipment. Um, so the Public Works Manager does have a budget request. I'm just going to pull up this memo because I can't don't have it memorized off the top of my head how much that request was for. All right, let's see here. Where the snow is in the packet way more times than I thought was. There we go. All right, so um, the uh, plow and pusher combo would be uh, $9,800. And the, um, the sidewalk broom would be uh, $4,000, and an electric uh, snowblower um, would be $1,500. Um, in addition to those costs, because the, um, the sidewall room would be gas-powered, there wasn't an electric alternative, um, we had a chat with our EAC chair about that, and he recommended, per the Climate Action Plan, that the borough uh, institute a carbon fee on itself to make up, basically we would be setting aside money to offset those emissions by doing work elsewhere in the borough to reduce our emissions. And our EAC chair uh, did some calculations and found that for, well that's for all the items, but for the sidewalk room alone it would be about a $500 uh, contribution and the truck we're going to talk about in a minute would be about a $2,500 contribution. So just for the snow stuff between the carbon fee and the uh, devices uh, and the equipment our public works manager has asked for, um, we will be looking at a total of $15,800. Uh, this is not in the budget for this year. Um, however, um, I can note that uh, we talked a little in about the budget. We're getting to a point in the year where I can forecast the budget a little bit and you know, thankfully we are a little bit ahead of um, budget right now. 
And I think some of this stuff, you know, will help offset some overtime costs. It'll help offset some salt costs. Not that full amount, but some of that. So I do think financially the borough can handle it. And I, I think it would improve how we respond to snow events and, and our environmental impact of that response. Yeah, I agree. I mean, in particular, um, the plow attachment is for the skid steer, so it's to allow them to be able to plow better in really small, challenging streets, cul-de-sacs, and areas like that, which is really hard for them to do now. And that seemed like a really good suggestion. The sidewalk room will allow them to much more rapidly go to sidewalks around the parks, which is a lot of sidewalk. And, you know, in the last storm, that was a real challenge for them. And so um, these things, these purchases seem to make a lot of sense. And obviously, the calcium spreader. I mean, after he quoted us the reduction in salt, it was just an astronomical reduction in, in the salt we need to use. So. And then, um, I'm sorry, I'm just sharing my screen real quick for the benefit of people on Zoom and any future people watching uh, this recording. Uh, so those are what the items look like. And then specifically in regards to a truck, uh, unfortunately our capital plan had called for replacing a public works truck next year. Unfortunately, the truck itself apparently wasn't aware of that plan <laughs> and uh, has pretty much gone to butt. Um, our public works manager is working to get price quotes um, for a vehicle. Um, again, we ran into a situation where we looked at some of the newer electric options uh, that are out there. We spoke with our EAC chair about it and felt that the um, technology just wasn't there yet for public works operations. Uh, we also spoke with the, I believe our public works manager spoke with the public works director in Lower Marion Township who mentioned that the trucks, the electric vehicles they've acquired for public works are for less intensive um, sort of work than what we would need. So again, talking at the EAC, we developed um, a carbon fee offset uh, for this uh, you know, proposed gas-powered vehicle. Uh, that offset is around $2,500. I'm going to look back at the memo for our public works manager to see what um, sort of pricing. Let's see here. But he says he doesn't have pricing. Yeah, right, yeah. So we don't have pricing on the truck yet. Um, so I've asked the public works manager to get that for us. And um, as soon as we have that, um, I could certainly come back to Borough Council as long as you're amenable with the overall plan and idea that we're talking about. Um, I'll also note as well, I don't I think he mentioned this in the memo, but um, Public Works is also planning on they have a Ford vehicle that's also that's no longer in service, and instead of completely replacing that, um, per our budget this year, they are getting an electric Gator vehicle um, that would replace that gas-powered vehicle. Um, and overall, their Public Works Department, I think, has done a lot of really environmentally conscious things. All their equipment now is electric. Um, as I hope and think for a council knows. And um, so, I mean, they, they do take this really seriously. And um, and so I, I just, I, I don't think they would tell us this if it wasn't the absolute truth in case of everything else they've shown and done. Yeah, I, I think that they mentioned that the snowblower will be able to use the same batteries they're using for the rest of the electronic, or the electric uh, yeah. yard maintenance, or the lawn maintenance equipment. So. And the sidewalk, sorry, the sidewalk room has other, you can use it for other things. I, that, I was like, ooh, the sweet gumball pickup with that. Ah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you could want that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bottle. Because thanks to the EAC and the infrastructure and office for holding ourselves accountable, I really appreciate that we're, doing, we're, we're taxing ourselves to put towards other great efforts. So yeah. thank the three groups for that. Absolutely. It sounds really good. That we don't have, we can find ways to make the budgetary adjustments to purchase these equipment this year. We can shift things. So, I mean, I'm not sure that I feel like you need to come to us for more approval. I mean, I'd be comfortable simply approving these purchases mm -hmm. as long as there's, you know. I'd like to, I mean, the truck is going to be a significant item. So, I'd like to see, you know, a dollar amount on the truck. And, okay. you know, but I think, well, I think we can just approve the other items right now. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, so I, 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 would propose, I would propose that we consider approving the uh, the items that we have a you know a dollar amount for, and then we approve in principle the truck, but we want mm -hmm. you know we, we save our final approval until we have price on it. So next month. Yeah. Uh, 
so that kind of fits the timeline. Yeah, I, I, I mean, well, I mean, would he, would he be able to buy it before the month is out if we approved it, or is it? He would be able to buy it before. It's really just important that we get it before we have our before snow season starts again. So let's. let's I, I prefer to you know actually approve the <laughs> to get the dollar amount before approving. So let's let's do the truck um, next month, hopefully. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, yeah. The way these sort of things work, I mean, I'm sure we could probably tell a vendor like. Hey, like, you know, if you could hold it for a few days, you know, like, you know, we just, we need counsel to talk about it. You know, yeah, I, think, I think we'd make that work. Really? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think counsel actually has yeah. to so let's, let's, uh, make a motion. Let's clarify, yeah, let's have a motion to uh, approve the purchase of the uh, snow removal items. I would like to, to make approve the purchase of the, uh, of the snow removal items, the uh, the the, uh, the plow attachment, the sidewalk room, and I suppose the uh, the attachment for the electric snowblower, and uh, conditionally approve the purchase of the replacement truck pending final pricing. Okay. Is that everything? Second yes. half. Okay. Any further discussion? All right, uh, we're voting to approve the purchase of uh, snow equipment. All those in favor? Okay, motion passes the All right, next we have uh, fire inspections and soliciting permits. There's no invading warrant here, so who wants to take this motion? It says It says you? <coughs> I moved the Borough Council um, update the schedule for commercial fire inspections and peddling and soliciting permits. Is there a second? Second. second. All right. Um, I'll let Nicole speak to this one. Um, so as mentioned in our uh, June uh, work session, uh, I realized that council ha had an opportunity to discuss the commercial fire inspection program and also that um, council had had an opportunity to approve a fee for it. Um, so I did some research as council requested on uh, what other areas charge again we've had a conversation that fees are really based on the borough's cost but as a you know sanity check of sorts to make sure we're not putting an undue burden on our business community i looked at what all else is out there um, as i think i mentioned that being lots of other places based it off of um, square footage um, however um, because so many businesses in the borough are around the same size um, that's why we just have a single fee proposed and I think if you look at comparable square footages to this fee, I do think it makes sense, like Upper Marion. So I'm proposing, generally, I mean, the most expensive I'm proposing is $200 a year. And at Upper Marion, it's you know $250 a year for something that's 1,200 to 3,000 square feet, which I think what a lot of borough businesses would, um, would fall under. Um, now, admittedly, uh, Conch Hopkins Borough is a little bit cheaper than that. They're at fifty dollars for you know thirty or fifty dollars for uh, comparable size buildings. Um, let's see. When you get to Haver, uh, Haverford Township, you're at one hundred and five dollars, uh, and then I couldn't find for Radnor, Swarthmore, and uh, Lower Marion. Um, so I mean, if we wanted to reduce the fees down a little bit to be more in line, somewhere between Upper Marion and, and the examples. From Conchalk and Powderford, I would, you know, I would definitely, um, definitely would understand that. And if we wanted to go to like a hundred for annual and two hundred for biannual, um, I, you know, I think that would make sense as well. I, I would be happy with lowering that cost, going on the lower end of that. Yeah, maybe that we can spectrum. maybe we can ask our uh, our inspector to keep track of what he's charging the borough and make sure that they buy on and then we can adjust At least it. for the first year, yeah. you know, or for six months, even, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the intent of these fees would be to cover the cost of the inspection. Exactly. So if we find out the inspection costs more, the fees should go up. Mm -hmm. Right. But we don't know because we, we don't know. We haven't done this yet. Yeah, exactly. This is just our best guess of how much time the inspector would have to spend between scheduling the inspections and doing them and writing the report. Yeah. All right, so we need to set our, our costs here. Um, does anyone want to propose a, do we want more discussion or do we want to propose a, a dollar level? Well, I 
So the, the original proposal was yeah. 200 and 300. Samantha also suggested we could come down to 100 and... Uh, Do you want a motion? Uh, okay. I don't see any more discussion, so I think a motion might be in order. I, I move that we set the um, the fees for a fire inspection at one hundred dollars for annual inspections and two hundred dollars for a biannual inspection. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay. Any discussion of that number? All right. So we're voting to set the fees at one hundred dollars and two hundred dollars for fire inspections. Uh, all those in favor? Okay. The motion passes. Uh, now, soliciting permits. Yes. So. Um, uh, it came to my attention that it was like the uh, the forms and some of the, the fees and such we have currently for our peddling and soliciting permit are based on an older, outdated um, version of our regulations. Um, so um, the actual regulations we have on the books now, when someone applies for a peddling and soliciting permit, it's good for a period of 90 days. Um, our current fee is $10 per day. So I don't think our intention was to charge someone $900 for a soliciting <laughs> permit. Um, so again, I looked at what some other places do, and this is where I came up with a proposal of $100 for 90 days. Upper Marion charges $100 for 90 days. Uh, Haverford Township uh, has a little bit different, but they basically charge $100, uh, $150. Uh, Radnor is $110 for 90 days, and then for um, uh, Swarthmore, Conshock, and Lower Marion, I couldn't find their fees for it. Um, so I would like to sit with my recommendation of changing that fee from $10 per day to $100 per 90 days. Mm -hmm. And can we just clarify, um, I guess for Council and the public too, that we are not applying that hipster permit to ever let's say the Narborough Civic Association Earth Day, if someone comes to sell some awesome Yeah, so um, two things about it. Um, the um, uh, the updated regulations for this um, make it clear that this applies mainly to door-to-door -door sales um, and, um, and that our business privilege tax council during the consent agenda passed a resolution um, you know, waiving the requirement for a business privilege tax registration for like one-time festival vendor um, sort of activities exactly. I just wanted to get clarified kind of for the public. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this, this is just door-to-door -door -door sales. Yeah, and selling. It may also be worth noting that the ordinance exempts your traditional children door-to-door, -door, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, schools going around. Lemonade stands, that's what it is. Why, well, I think nonprofit canvassers as well. Actually, it may. It, it, it doesn't does. apply to religious canvassing because of First Amendment protections. They're not technically selling, I don't want to say anything value, but uh, commercial uh, items. So um, uh, they would need to, to, to obtain a permit in the first place. Would it apply to people who are like, like services or they could come to your door and say, do you need to place some of those? Or is it just yeah. for sales of goods? Okay, yeah. Yeah, and I'll be honest, and like in the you know six or seven years, you know that I've you know been really, really been doing this for management. Um, I would say I've seen like four, maybe that actually you know didn't qualify for one of the exemptions. And actually, yeah, it was the main one I remember was someone going door to door selling uh, solar panels. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah. um, back when Solar City was really doing their thing. So. Nice. Nice. Well, that's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can try, yeah. Please make him. <laughs> he doesn't knock on your door. I don't think that's true. Yeah. No, I think, I think it, it does count this. I think it does count. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's annoying. That's, that's, that's what I think. Are you, you looking into that show? Like that's what, no, it's not. Not, not door to door. It's, it's a business. That, I didn't I didn't know it was required to door. Whatever. The ordinance is what it is, and I think just the fee, I think that's what I'm saying. We're good. All right, I, I will entertain a motion to set the fee for the uh, soliciting, peddling and soliciting permits. Does anyone like to make a motion to set the fee? I move that we set a fee for $100 for 90 days for the uh, house permit. All right, is there a second? Second. Seconded. Any discussion? All right, we're voting to set the uh, fee for the house permit at $100 for 90 days. All those in favor? Okay, motion. I believe that's it for 9G. Uh, 9H. Uh, 
Each bag. Ah, you have to talk about this. I don't know anything yeah. about this. <laughs> One more that I need to bring. Consideration of contractor for Burrow, each bag. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, second. Can you see your hands, yeah, um, yeah, so um, so as council had previously discussed, we went out and got bids for the um, proposed HVAC uh, project. Um, here are the bids we received. Um, the bids range from a low bid from Hirschberg Mechanical of $486,850 to a high of $737,000 from Micro Mechanical. Um, it is interesting to note that the bid, the three highest bids, were in a range of six seventy six hundred seventy five thousand to seven hundred thirty seven thousand, whereas Hirschberg was, uh, you know, at four hundred eighty six eight fifty, which the borough was very grateful to see, but it also raised a little bit of eyebrows in terms of making sure that you know this person didn't misunderstand the scope of the work or something like that. So the borough engineer. Um, had a conversation with Hirschberg Mechanical, uh, felt that they did have a very good understanding of the scope of the project. Uh, in addition, the borough engineer contacted uh, four uh, references for Hirschberg uh, Mechanical, uh, one of which was actually um, our own uh, code enforcement, uh, third party code enforcement provider, uh, Yerkes, um, as well as some schools and libraries and other you know, facilities of a similar scope to what we're looking at here. And it was just overwhelmingly, massively positive reviews of you know, work being done on time, no issues with work, um, you know, very responsive. Um, so I think if, if we're gonna do the project, I have no concern about going with Hirschberg Mechanical. Now the other item I want to make sure to address to maybe put council and the public at ease is you may remember that um, for this project, uh, KCBA had estimated the cost of this project at a little bit less than $300,000. And that was the number that was originally used when we went out to borrow the um, million dollars for Burr building improvements. It not only included this project, but several others that um, you know totaled um, I forget now off the top of my head, but I want to say somewhere between eight hundred and nine hundred thousand uh, dollars. Um, so what I did in the updated treasurer's report that's in the packet for this month, um, I went ahead and plugged in the Hirschberg uh, bid number <coughs> into there, and I really took a look through some of the other items KCBA had and found that there actually was some redundancy. Uh, for example. Um, they had, there was $90,000 in there for LED lights, which we're paying for um, separately as part of our LED conversion program. Um, I've already had borough staff start working on some of the other items on that list, and we recently found out that the KCBA recommendation for ADA water fountains, for example, the borough was already in compliance with. Um, so things like that got you know removed uh, from the list. Um, so by doing that, and then with the, you know, the slack that we did have in that budget, we are able to accommodate this cost without, so far without removing any items you know, from the list that, you know, that we didn't have a good reason to, uh, to remove. Um, we can't bank on this, but of course the other thing still hanging out there, you all may remember, is we applied for two grants related to this project the county one I mentioned, my manager's report, we did not receive. However, the local, uh, the statewide local share grant for two hundred fifty thousand dollars is still hanging out there, and I can't, I, I don't want to commit to anything or make any promises. But all I will say is I've had some positive feedback uh, from the state about that application. Um, so while there is a realistic chance we'll get that, we can't bank on that. I would kind of consider that more of a bonus if we do get it. Um, but even if we don't, um, I do think there is, you know, currently sufficient funding in the money that we borrow for this purpose if council, you know, wants to do this project. And I'm obviously very biased on this, and I, I would definitely like to see council move forward with this project. Yeah, I mean, this is an urgent need, you know, for members of the public. We, we have to close Pro Hall now uh, on hot days uh, in the afternoons because it's, we can't have people working in here, it's, just, it's too hot. So you know, it, is, it is important that uh, this repair gets done. 
in my opinion. Yeah, do we have, is, I mean, does Hertz Park have, if we were to approve this bid and move forward, do we know what their time schedule is? Like, what, do we need to wait for any, like, components as they're, like, pipeline issues or? Yeah, I didn't have any indication from the um, borough engineer about the answer to that question. Um, I think that's the definitely a conversation we would have once the bid is awarded. But at least everyone else who's worked with them said they've been pretty timely and pretty responsive. Any other questions or comments from council? All right. Uh, yeah, I do think you need to you need move to your accept motion. a specific bid here. Sure, yeah, yeah I, I move to award the bid for the Borough HVAC project to Hushburn County. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, I'll, I'll point out that we do have a letter from our Borough Engineer recommending that we award it to, uh, yeah. to Hushburn. Any other discussion? Okay, uh, we're voting to award the bid for the air conditioning to Hirschberg. All those in favor? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Yeah, All right, uh, that is it for our action items. Uh, the monthly reports have been filed and are in the packets. Uh, 11A, new business. Uh, Mr. Walco, you want to talk about Shirtliff versus City of Boston, or the City of Boston? Sure, uh, I just wanted to bring a, a recent case that came out of the United States Supreme Court to the borough's attention make a recommendation for a council uh, based upon current uh, operations uh, that, that may be affected by this case. And in the case is the Sherlock versus the city of Boston, uh, which dealt with a situation where the United States Supreme Court uh, says that uh, the city of Boston essentially opened up their flagpoles to, to make it a, a public forum by creating a system that allowed the public to submit flags that they would like to see raised on the flagpole. And in, in allowing the public to submit those flags and having a, a permit and a system of acceptance, the, the city was not in a position to determine which flags they wanted to raise and which flags that they didn't want to raise. That then needed to be impermissible viewpoint discrimination. Uh, essentially, they said that the flagpole is now a public forum, just as if you know, someone wanted to go to a park and, and, and make a speech, the borough couldn't say, oh, we, uh, we like what you're saying, you can talk, uh, but we don't like what you're saying, We're gonna, we have, you have to leave the park. That, that's not constitutional. Uh, that's not even protection. So uh, that's what the case came out. The, the issue of how I see that relates to what the borough is currently doing is, is the system that the borough does with accepting public comments uh, in written form prior to meetings. Uh, even on the agenda, it says that written public comment can be submitted uh, 30 hours prior to the meeting. That is then put into the packet uh, that's on the borough's website. Am I correct? No, it's separate. It's put on the borough's It's put on the borough's website um, in association with that meeting. It's then made available to the public. Um, the the problem I see with that is then the borough can't really be in a position to say what should be in that and what should not be in that. that is the packet the right word? The, the, or the packet. Uh, borough's website. The website. And since it's on the website, I mean, essentially there could be advertising material, and new content, irrelevant, lengthy, burdensome materials mixed in with relevant materials, disinformation, propaganda. Uh, and that's, that could be perceived and confusing to the public because that is on the borough's website. And it, it's, I think, a, a not a good position to put the borough staff in to, to make those determinations as to what is slanderous, what is propaganda, what is false, and what is legitimate public content. Um, and again, there could be certain liabilities by making those wrong decisions, either one way or another. Doing that also makes it difficult for, for the borough to respond to any of that comment because it doesn't happen in real time. Uh, certainly, what I'm not saying is that you shouldn't uh, let the public speak. 
public can come to a public meeting, public can, can attend via Zoom and make their public comment. And that's what's required in order to fulfill the Pennsylvania Sunshine Act uh, at for, for an open meeting. Certainly, the members of the public can still write to borough council, uh, email them with their concerns or their support. And certainly, if borough council still wants to, they could share uh, a letter or they could share comments with the public. But the issue here is who has control over what is on the borough website. And the borough should have that control. It's government speech, it's the borough speech. And by having the borough make that decision, you then close down that public forum and can be more selective as to what is on uh, your website and choose then which comments could uh, be on your website and are relevant. Because it's, it's, it's your choice, it's not a public forum at that time. So it's my recommendation that in order to avoid potential uh, impermissible viewpoint discrimination, to avoid potential confusion to the public, that the borough discontinue its practice of allowing the public to provide written comment for inclusion on the borough website prior to borough meetings. Um, otherwise, I think it opens up a, a number of issues. Thoughts from council? Um, sorry, it's not, it's not time for public comment right now. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Please raise your hand. Yeah, that, that seems like a really wise advice. I, I, I agree, because I, I don't think we intended to create a public Forum. Correct. So, and, and I and you know when you read what happened in Boston, I don't think they intended to do that either. So it's like, no, let's not go so, down that path. Can I make a suggestion it's, or offer a suggestion? Because when we were looking into this some time ago, I looked into see how Lower Marion handles written public comment, and the way they do it is they take you know like separate written public comment to the office and council, and it's like if it's like this is a written public comment, I'd like to sort of provide to the meeting. And basically, the, their chair, like their the chair of the committee, like their head, whatever they call it, chair of the commission, <coughs> will just sort of say, "We received public comment from so and so. We received public comment from so and so, and they're on file with the with the township secretary." And so, basically, the board, like the, the township would be in this case would be for borough manager, would just keep those things on file, and so so that there was at least a process for people who couldn't come to a meeting or for whom it's extremely difficult to stand up and speak, or just who have a lot more to say and they can say in three minutes, because God knows I'm a long form speaker. And so when I get ready, you just go. So I feel like, like that's a reasonable thing to do. I mean, we could just offer that um, possibility so that people have written comment, we'll have a note of it made you know, by Fred, by the president at the meeting, you know, some, during public comment, we'll see these written comments there on file with the borough secretary. Is that a reasonable process I mean, to follow? I, I think that is reasonable. I think the, the concern is the representation that the actual content will be posted. So right. In so that you situation, that you're not posting right. the comments. Um, so I'm wondering when they do that, do they say, Mary Smith at you know this address commented on this issue? Is that what they're doing, or are they just saying we received X number of comments about this issue, or? I think when I looked at the minutes, it was like, you know, Chairman Bern, Bernheim said, you know, noted that, whatever. I mean, you can look and see how he did it, but it was just like basically the name and address and maybe the subject matter. I mean, Aaron needs to kind of do something similar Sometimes, like that. Yeah. And just yeah. so like, you know, and, and you know, if whatever written comments were received and then said where you could find them if you wanted to work them up, like they weren't filed with the yeah. secretary. Yeah. I just wondered how much detail we were thinking we'd want to give. I didn't look like there was much detail. Yeah. Well, maybe. Maybe we leave that up to Fred to decide. Yeah, why don't I come yeah. back with this next month? Why don't I think about it and, uh, and I can come back next month and offer my thoughts uh, based on that. But for now, I think the proposal is that we, uh, you know, we just continue the current practice of, of putting things on the website. So yeah, I think that's fine, but I think, I think we, we should have to... a practice wherein people can submit written comment that is part of a public record. Where maybe maybe you have to find it and file it in the office, but. I think that's that's a reasonable practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me watch. Maybe I'll watch that part of the, the Lower Marion meeting and see how they handle. I, I really agree with that. As we can show. It's, that makes a lot of sense. It seems organized and manageable. I mean, the other reason and the reason why it's a repository for public. It creates a repository for public comment. I think that's really what it's important to have that option. Mm -hmm. 
the other thing it would offer is not only are some people sort of more inclined to write in long form and they may have a lot of reasoning to put forward, we are increasingly becoming sort of a visual mm -hmm. culture and some people would like to put their ideas forth in the form of like illustrations and sketches or they want to send photographs of something and they, you know, they want to make that part of their public comment. They want to comment on something that they want to show you. And a picture can be worth a thousand words. So um, that was the other reasons for wanting to sort of meet a three minute verbal comment is one form of expression, but you know, people may have other things to say. And moving forward, this isn't part of this discussion, but I hope we can think about the process by which if somebody is coming to a meeting, for example, to give comment and they want to talk about a condition they've observed in the borough, that we may have a way to share that visual relatively easily. I mean, technology should maybe permit us to, to figure out a way to do that. So they don't have to spend three minutes describing what they're talking about. They can just show it and then make their comment and it's a little bit more efficient. Okay, so let, let, me, uh, let me look into that and maybe speak to Samantha about the, the visual proposal that you're, that you're suggesting here, see how much of a challenge it would be to incorporate that into the meeting. And uh, I can come back with a, a proposal based on uh, what everyone said uh, next month. For now, however, uh, does, does anyone have any more comments about the suggestion that we uh, discontinue the postings on the website? I would so, take John's advice on that. I mean, I think yeah. this is new case law and we need to... All right, so can I just ask for a show of hands? Uh, all those in favor of uh, changing the policy? So uh, we'll stop posting to the uh, posting comments to the website. So the agenda should also be revised. Yes. Okay. Sorry, do we need to make that like an official motion? Or mm -hmm. like that's no, that's that, that, just interim for next time. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on this? All right. Old business. Uh, 12A is uh, 201 save on status update. Yeah, so the uh, probably the biggest update I have to share is, um, as I mentioned previously, I had a chance to interact with the firm uh, HRA and talk about what sort of services they might be able to provide to the borough in terms of evaluating what option four would actually mean for the borough. And, uh, un you know, unfortunately, they're, they sound like a very high caliber firm. And um, uh, the proposal I got back from them uh, was a very high cost, um, and so uh, honestly, it was it was a, at a cost level that I didn't even feel it was appropriate to bring to council or the public's uh, attention. Um, I think at this point, I mean, we've tried a lot of different avenues to find the perfect sort of partner to help us decide what option four actually means, and I want to emphasize, I think that for council to make an educated decision on the future of 201 Sabine between you know, the various options, including option one, which would be a, a you know, total open space on the property. We actually have to know what option four means. We've heard a lot of concerns from the public about some of their fears about what option four might mean to them. Um, however, at no point have we actually really defined what option four means beyond the inclusion of childcare, and that's the only, you know, at least in the things that I've written and seen have, have mentioned with that, and um, as well as an expansion of the existing open space there as well. And I think instead of looking for a perfect partner, I think we're at a point after, you know, months of trying to find a perfect partner, we just need to find a good partner and I think out of the options that we have and the materials we've seen and, and such, I think the County Redevelopment Authority could serve as a good partner to us in terms of working with us on what option four might mean and then doing a non-binding you know, search to see what sort of actual viability there is for whatever that vision is. And I think once we have that information, then council would actually know what option four means in terms of making a decision on the future of the property. Um, and so my recommendation tonight to borough council is to consider uh, moving forward uh, and working with the county redevelopment authority to 
develop what option four actually means. Seeing no one's over here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I actually kind of feel like the county RDA is, is sort of a perfect partner. Um, you know, not to be honest with you. I mean, I understand that there's been some doubt expressed, like, well, And any other, like the firm that you just mentioned, you know, that seems like they want to come in and they want to like do a whole, but do like a highest and best use analysis. That's like the big thing. They immediately want, you need me to do a highest and best use analysis, which is cost of fortune. And it's also like, well, you know, that's kind of like, we're not really interested in trying to wring every dollar out of this profit. Like that's not our goal. And I think it's very hard to convey that in a way that with many of these firms that really resonates with them. I think they kind of like, well, you think that, but you don't know what you want. And I feel like the county is the one one entity, you know, that's been here, that's been like, look, we've done these projects. Like, we did this, we did that, we worked with this municipality over here, we worked with Morristown, we worked with Lower Marion. And you know, we're ready to, to help you get what you want done. That's what we do. We're not here to sell you a lot of services. Like to me, that was like, I like that. <laughs> it's very pragmatic. And I think right. that we have a sense of what would not be acceptable to us at this point. Like, I think there's a lot that was not acceptable that I don't want to pay a firm hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to get to the point where they're, they're finally like, oh, we see that you're not going to accept these things. <laughs> yeah. like, so. And I did want to add on, I think one of the unique advantages the county has, which they mentioned us and kind of I think hope dovetails with the point Michelle made, is that, you know, you might argue this. You know, the solicitor know better than me, but if you went through a traditional RFP process with a you know with a private uh, firm assisting with it, the borough might be compelled to take whatever brings the most money out of the property. Whereas by working with the county, they have statutory authority where we don't have to do it that way, um, where we can balance all the different needs of the property as part of a holistic view of option four. All right, I see a lot of odds here, so I think let's move forward with uh, the county. All right, I'll uh, follow up with the county about what the next step in the process is, and um, you know, I'll absolutely have that for, uh, if, I'll absolutely have it for council on uh, you know, July 21, but I think, um, I mean, if council is comfortable with it, I mean, given that we don't meet again for about five weeks, if there's any action I can take with the county that doesn't necessarily require uh, council approval. I want to see what sort of level of appetite we would have uh, after that. What do you have in mind? Um, well, I mean, if they want to do like a you know like a kickoff meeting or something like that, or um, um, or even start actually working on you know drafting something up for council to review. Like, would council be comfortable with those sort of actions going ahead and, and starting to move forward? Again, with the emphasis that a Council would have to approve anything before it would go out for bid, and that my intention would be it would be non-binding um, bid because again the goal here is to find out what option four means, not to commit the borough to a particular path. Uncomfortable, I, mean, I, I hate to wait five weeks when folks can mm -hmm. get started at least uh, in terms of some compressor review. The other thing um, that council is going to need to think about in terms of working with the um, RDA, uh, with the County Redevelopment Authority, is something that was brought up uh, when I had a chance to meet and discuss with them as part of building their proposal. Is um, I will all due respect to um, our solicitor and, and his firm, who I think has worked with the County RDA before. Council would need to decide if they would like, uh, you know, Kill County's office to work. With the RDA and drafting up, you know, some of the reviewing and drafting some of the agreements that would be necessary, or if council would like uh, any special counsel uh, to be involved in that process. That's not a decision to be made tonight, but just something I wanted to put out there as well. I mean, that's something it might also make sense to ask the RDA for their their thoughts on that and what their prior you know experience might have been. Yeah. And I, and I believe also that um, you know uh, solicitor Walco's firm has had some experience with the 
uh, RDA. The RDA uh, has their own solicitor. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, sort of what she has their four ingredients that would make sense. They could start that process then for us to start from scratch. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that would be the common approach for that. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, are you talking about home agreements with respect to the borough's contract with the RDA? Correct. Yeah, okay. But I think you were talking about should we move down the road. Right. All yeah. the many contractual relationships that would happen if we, if we were to enter into, I mean, this is a ways down the road, which is why it's not, you know, if, if, if we did put out an RP and if we actually did decide to work with somebody else on a project, then there would be like a, a lot of a lot of legal work to put Right. And again, if it's a situation That's where that would be the RDA already has done that, I'm not sure if as well, um, I'm not sure it make financial sense for the borough to continue with that process as they can always be like your consultant. But I would certainly let you know one way or another at some point in time. But I, I, I do think it, would, it may make financial sense to, to use the, their solicitor in that regard. All right, we'll definitely, uh, me and me will definitely uh, keep in touch about that. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Uh, 12B is the streetery safety barrier design and cost estimate. <clears throat> so uh, Borough Council had requested uh, the last time we talked about this topic uh, that we actually uh, put together a design that could then be provided to uh, contractors uh, to actually construct uh, the proposed streetery uh, design uh, that I you know, kind of stole from uh, from Council Vice President Panopoulos, so I appreciate putting that together. And uh, let's see, let me get to the actual picture and then I'll share it for everyone on Zoom and everyone here. All our pages of reports yeah. and yeah. such. All the reports are on file, and here they are. Yes, yeah. they're all there. All right, that's the public that. works report. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we go to Sherpa? All right, here we go. Let me zoom out for a second here. Let me share my screen. Everyone on Zoom knows what I'm talking about now. And for anyone watching uh, this recording in the future. All right. So let me see if I actually have the. Uh, I don't know if I put the. Uh, you did. It's like one up. Here. I didn't put the original rendering in the, um, in the packet, but I hope and think everyone kind of remembers what that looked like. Basically, it's going to be a. Um, a cedar, uh, a cedar box with a, a planting uh, strip over a uh, water-filled uh, Jersey barrier, and um, so this is the actual sort of construction uh, schematics for it. And in addition, our uh, building code staff estimated that the cost to um, construct one of them, uh, labor materials, everything, would be eight hundred and ninety dollars for each one. Um, I mean, I think, you know, that doesn't seem outrageous to me. That sounds about right. And, um, you know, we kind of considered it a, a modular design, if you will. We had talked about at first, maybe you would have something that would cover multiple Jersey barriers. And then the concern I got into about that was, um, you know, each, each streetery in the borough kind of has their own sort of layout they're working off of. And I didn't want to restrict that layout necessarily by saying, like, you have to put three jersey barriers in a row right here. And then the question, you know, how do you handle corners and turns? So that's how I arrived at the idea. Okay, well, one cover for each jersey barrier, and then you can just kind of, you know, set it up however you need. Um, I've not had a chance to fully discuss that with, um, with our chief of police or public works um, to make sure, you know, to know if that causes any safety concerns or not. Um, but the design we have here from Hierarchies would be, again, a single, uh, single cover over a single uh, jersey barrier. And again, the estimated cost would be $890 for each one. Uh, so, uh, if I can interrupt, I thought Kevin gave a good reason why there couldn't be the planner on the top. There was a reason that there was a height issue. 
Looking back. And we said, yeah, if people want to put a plan on there, that's fine. But no longer would there be. I think it might be oh, darn it. Um, I can't remember the reason why, but it was really good when we said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of yeah, I know. Um, well, I know in this design, he does have the uh, he does have the uh, have the uh, the pleater, uh, strip in he there. He gave a really good. I think it was with the eye. You needed to have eyesight in the street, but we might want to look back because he gave a re well. The code enforcer saying you can't do it, so I think that we should probably follow up with him because I forget the reason why. It's written that you can. It's written. The code thing is written specifically that you can have. Okay, plants. I would follow up with him. He, he gave a really good reason why he couldn't be that high with the planner. Well, I would say, um, I mean, Kevin did. Kevin is the person who, who designed uh, this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, like I said, I can't remember the specific okay. reason. I do remember some brief discussion on no, that. Okay. And I did just want to confirm that the borough was a good so $900 per Jersey barrier is you're looking at five grand per parking spot. Per street. Per street. How, how, many, how many Jersey barriers do we have right now that are? That are blocking off street or you know. I would say each street area probably has like five or six. So the yeah. borough is absorbing that cost. We're not asking the borough each business to pay five thousand dollars for a cedar covering that they didn't right. design, correct? Right. Well, and what this construction would get on. <laughs> Sorry, what's that all? <laughs> He's being so uh, it just it um, does it does seem like a lot of money. But um, I mean but, but they, they haven't really been good. That's a cost estimate. I mean, I, I assume that they would have, they would be, um, you know, um, competitively good. This looks like or, solid sheets. Or we would sheets find a local carpenter to build them. Right. Are these like and solid then, sheets of cedar? I'm confused. Uh, yeah. I would never even heard of that. I mean, I've you could just use, either. there's a lot of, they could it, be it built. Absolutely. It's a design. Yeah. Yeah. I literally yeah. gave them a picture of, like, I, I mean, they saw, you know, what, what we discussed at the last meeting. It's cedar like plywood. They were slats. They were slats. Yeah. It's an expensive yeah. This is why. It's just, it's well. the, the solid sheet of cedar might be expensive. That's all. Less expensive it's, material. Cedar can be expensive. But it could be, it could be, just, you know, there could be some design engineering, you know, some kind of um, design engineering and cost. I would feel like a carpenter is a carpenter probably the best be situated yeah. person. Yeah. So like I, what we need. Mean. Yeah. Like even a local carpenter. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's okay. That's originally what I wanted to do, and then council said no, we need to get like a design for well, this is, I mean, this is the design, so then the, we just get this. We just, yes, but I, but I think this is good. This is a really, I think this is a really good approach. I think it's a great design, and I just think we should just get it priced for real by a local carpenter and not, I mean, this is just cost estimates. So, cost estimates are often like variance with what a real. I was confused yeah. that the cost estimate had price for paint siding. Did we for what siding? Paint oh. siding. I don't know. But we could we siding? could also have alternate materials. So it could be like it could be, for example, Manager Brian. It could be put out to bid with this specification with some alternative mm -hmm. materials as options, like for all for alternative bid schemes. So like plywood siding, whatever that is, versus you know some kind of plank. Plank side or yeah, so rough cut like a rough cut. I, I will also tell you. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Two sorry. questions. One, I'm confirming that we're. I think that seems astronomical for planks. Um, so my my first is I want to underscore that the borough is paying for this. We are not expecting businesses mm -hmm. to pay for these coverings for these years bears. Um, and I guess the second is I think we have to move on this for Pete's sake. The city of Philadelphia has had this in place for two years and we can't seem to. Why would we well. move on? To this? Yeah. It's just taking a really long time, and we're at the height of alfresco dining and our tenants and dispersing. Um, I mean, I, I think th this price is high enough that, you know, we got to think about it a little bit. Oh, for about, sure. Yeah, that seems just, just, we can't just, And it's not the design. <laughs> hey, 25K on this. Yeah. Just saying there's a big difference between your piece cost estimate and what our local carpenters might be, sure. knowing that they could build a quantity of 10 or 15 or whatever it is. Yeah. So it sounds then like there's two actions that might make sense for me to take. Number one is to talk to your piece and be like, hey, I want to make sure that I understand what this design is and that, you know, is there any alternate way of doing it that would reduce your estimated costs? And then number two, 
show this to you know a couple of carpenters and be like, hey, what do you think this would cost you to, to build this? Yeah. Like, I don't think what's up there is what you showed us. It's fine. I mean, in my view, it's perfectly fine. It's it just maybe it's, expensive it's a good design. design. It's just so, maybe some some alternative labor. alternative materials yes, with the same design. Can, can I give you a, a third option? Um, this is all right. So I was looking at Jersey Barrier covers, and you know the companies that make Jersey Barriers will also sell like barricade covers that will mm -hmm. cover the Jersey Barriers. So. We ought, to, we ought to at least get a price for what it would cost. I'm going to have to go into details, but just a general price for what it would cost to put a cloth cover, or I don't even know what they, they're made out of, but they're, you know. They're like sleeves. They're $100. Yeah, a, sleeve, a sleeve to go over, $100. And you can per, personalize it. I mean, I think you just have to get this done. What are they point. made of? Uh, I don't know if you just have jersey berries. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is a little bit of a committee <laughs> project out here, yeah. and yeah. I just wondered if it could go like for at least or if they could just have a little side about it and get some more information. So so I, I, think, I think we're not going to make a decision tonight. Let's get more information and it can maybe, go back to, maybe, as it's been discussed in infrastructure. Maybe the way to think about it. this is how much, would be, how much would we be willing to authorize to spend for the bar oh, barrier covers for one parking space spot. And then, and then we're going to have alternatives could fit within that budget. Well, so the alternative is $100 for a, a you know, That's the maximum that you would spend? What's that? Is the, are you saying that's the maximum? No, I'm saying spend? that we could, you know, the reason we like these wood ones is because they seem more attractive than the, the sleeves, right? So if the sleeve is $100, that's our, our low end. What, you know, we want, we're going to pay more because these are nice. I'm, I'm asking the what, what's the maximum that we think would make sense for the road to spend for a decorative cover? For to cover the Jersey bars for one spot. Like, what's... I don't think I have to see cost the $200. I mean, not 900 Can I say that? No, I'm asking what you would say. I, I'd have to see what the options were, but 200 I mean, if you're asking me, like, gun to the head, no, it's like, yeah, 200 pace, but we can spend the 200 the way to decide. I think the way to decide yeah. is to see what you okay. can get and then decide if what you can get of quality is worth it. If I had thought that if, if I had, was not willing to spend more than $200 I would have at, attempted to kill this before we asked your piece to do this because it was quite obvious that this would cost in the range of about a thousand dollars per barrier. Uh, I mean, if so we like knew that. if we knew this was the greatest thing in the world and it was going to be super elegant and really well made and last us ten years, we'd feel like, oh, that's a pretty good right. deal. Right. Yeah. It's just it's not. We don't have enough clarity about what it. I don't know. I'm looking at it from here. I'm, I'd like to look, really examine it and think about what the design is, how you build it. Okay, so I'm hearing desire for more information and discuss again, hopefully next month. All right. But I think if our budget is that low, we should look at this. I, I'm, I'm not sure it's that low, but I'm I think we, got, we have to get... To Bob's point, I have to see, I need more I do, information. I can't answer that question, but not $1,000, that's for sure. And when I spoke to Ira about this, he also had concerns about the cost. You know, it could be here at the meeting. But, yeah. You know, sorry, I think, okay, uh, sorry, Barbara. And I just think the one other thing that we should think about, too, is that Yes, we could do $100 per Jersey barrier and have these things, but how long would they last? They're probably, you know, there's probably some shelf life on those that may be way less than what we would be willing to put the money into. Think about then, whenever, whatever other options we're looking at, think about the lifespan of them. And so it's, because I don't think the straighteries are going away. I, I think even if the pandemic is gone and we think, you know, not even thinking about anything like that, I think we're still going to have those outdoor eating spaces. And so we may be happy to invest in something that's going to last for 10 years, not a thousand dollars per Jersey barrier, but maybe some other point that we're like, no, that's that's fine because they're going to last a long time. And so, if the off the shelf, just to tag on the bar, if the off the shelf sleeves are all made of PVC or yeah. some horrible material that's going to go on a landfill, like we have to reconsider consider life cycle. And, sure. And I think just to Barbara's point, we would want them to last a long time. In the meantime, and that might be it. We might be looking at the perfect design that actually is great quality and going to last a long time. We just, it's hard to know from yeah. this proximity whether it is. I'm just confused, frankly, because if you're going to paint them, why, you wouldn't really need to make well, them out of cedar. You could make them out of right. like some That makes no sense. Yeah. So that's the question. So I, 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 I think if we ask the carpenter, <laughs> 
we got to get an answer yeah. for. And, and yeah. can we mention to the carpenter that there's sometimes as much as a six inch grade right. change, a log in the front of it, and they're going to need a leveling foot system <laughs> as well. We've like, got about a half dozen <laughs> carpenter architects in the yeah. 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 In the meantime, um, I do have a business that has asked, uh, actually, Kevin said he'd follow up, he did not, by the way. Um, at this restaurant, and they were still left kind of hanging. They're saying, like, how, how long are we talking? Should I be waiting? Can I decorate my jersey barrier? Can I put plants? Or is this is this going to happen in the next few weeks? Um, he was going to follow up, but obviously, it's not going to happen in the next few weeks. Do we want to let businesses know? Feel free to hang lights or decorate as you see fit until we can figure out what the heck we're going to do here. Well, yeah, I mean, we've already said, I mean, we've already said publicly that the implementation period on this is for the next set of, of outdoor dining permits. Right. So we're talking about next year. I would encourage, yeah, but right now it's dining outdoor season. I would encourage any one of our creative businesses to find an amazing way to decorate a jersey bag right. and have cheap. Yeah, and then who works? Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Go for it. I think the two things need to happen are geniuses in our town. Absolutely. From that follow up conversation with Kevin, which one, he gave a reason why we couldn't have the planners, but I can't remember what it was. Kind of um, but the second was he really brought up an issue that we sent them this streetery ordinance that, while it really did dot every I across every T, it was so overwhelming. And we were asking Ryan Christopher to hire an engineer for their permit, and it was overwhelming. So Kevin did suggest, I think perhaps now that we've tried to apply this, we can take a look at that again and think, let's maybe right size this for Nurbur. Um, so before we do this again, or maybe we need to adjust right now because folks aren't compliant because we're asking them kind of an overwhelming amount to do. All right, so why, why don't you get some feedback from the businesses on which provisions are oh, the problem? Oh, Kevin can tell you. Like, we yeah. should not have Ryan Christopher's have to hire an engineer. So there, are, there are some requirements that you're going to have to have mm -hmm. measurements for businesses. We're yes. Going to make sure that I would think that would be the only real issue that would be making sure things are certain distances from, from, from other objects that be compliant with ADA requirements, PVC requirements. So maybe could Kevin and John? That's that. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, sounds good. Okay. Uh, and then we will get the word out. I can do that, Michelle. We're telling them you can aesthetically improve these as long as it doesn't detract from the function and the safety feature, correct? I mean, I would, I mean, I would just tell people that like it's like it's not. We have actually passed the. We've agreed in principle to the aesthetic guidelines and all this, but like, you know, we still have to actually make a okay. resolution to yeah. actually do it. And so it, it's probably not in effect. So I mean, people can do whatever they want. Right now. Yeah. Well, but they don't want it to be taken down immediately. I think we're saying we're, yeah. we're still we're looking at next year. To true, 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 true. I don't think that's the kind of guidance they need. Right. Yeah. I think that's the kind of guidance they'd be looking. For. Great. And then potentially, if we were to get that grant for support for downtown economic, in fact, we may have money where that price range, what we would spend for Barrett, could be very different. Mm -hmm. Could be. All right, uh, I see no more discussion on streeters. Um, security camera policy. Oh, sorry, Chief, you know, it, it was brought up for the streeters whether you had any concerns about the, uh, the changes to the barriers or anything about the these studies. Not really, nothing off the top of my head. I'd be glad to discuss it more with Samantha um, okay. and, uh, and Jeff. Okay. That would be great. All Thank right. you, John. All right, security camera policy. Alright, so um, Council raised a lot of good questions at our last meeting in regards to the um, proposal I had for uh, doing a uh, security camera uh, with the skate park. Um, and it was, you know, Council had previously had some uh, some conversation last year about when we did uh, the camera to deal with illegal dumping over at the borough property. Um, but again, a lot of good concerns were raised and so I looked around at what other places do and uh, there's a, a sample policy in your packet from, uh, make sure I get the town name uh, correct here. Uh, I want to say Upper Nether Providence. Never. Upper Nether uh, Providence, yes, over in um, uh, Chester, Delaware? Delaware. Delaware County, thank you. Um, that I think covers a lot of the concerns that uh, and questions that Borough Council raised. 
Uh, I also wrote a memo where I really want to emphasize my main purpose for this is not, as I kind of mentioned at the meeting, but really to put it down in writing for us all, is not to be doing some sort of active monitoring situation. It's for when a you know criminal complaint is filed with the police department, when any kind of insurance claim or litigation is filed with the borough, that we then have something to go back and see and, and use, you know, and and uh, you know, figuring out what actually happened when those specific situations come up. Uh, and for uh, Nether Providence, um, you know, apparently they have cameras along just their right of ways. Obviously, that's not what the borough is doing here. So, I mean, we would need to tweak this policy a little bit. Um, but I think it has some good things that, like, you know, the cameras shall be clearly marked with the uh, municipal insignia. You know, various notice will be provided to the public of the existence uh, of the cameras. Um, there's some really great language in here. Um, you know, some non-discriminatory language. They, you know, the camera should not be used to monitor any person based on the person's race, gender, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, disability, religious or political affiliation, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Um, you know, reasonable expect expectation of privacy. Um, you know, these cameras are solely for, uh, um, for you know, video site. The purpose isn't to capture uh, audio. Uh, and then there's some language in here, you know, about how the information would be stored, uh, when it would be accessed, uh, and, you know, confidentiality and a process if there's any uh, citizen uh, complaints. Um, so I felt, you know, with some minor tweaking, I felt this would meet a lot of the concerns that council raised. And so I just wanted to see what council, see if I'm on the right track uh, with this for borough council. I, if there's any other specific questions or tweaks you'd like me to consider with this. Once again, Chief, did you have any uh, concerns about their policy? No, not at all. I, have, I would like to talk about the policy a little bit more with uh, Samantha. We do have the, uh, the exterior cameras going to start uh, on uh, the infrastructure on the 20th on Monday. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be working with them on Monday, switching my holiday from Monday until tomorrow. So I want to be here with them. And, uh, I can certainly, I think one of the things that we should probably discuss too is possibly a, a template from the vendor uh, that they go around and they do a lot of this, this type of work. Maybe there's something that we can, should consider with a policy uh, in terms of boilerplate from them as well to see if we can merge language together. Thanks. Councilor? Barbara? Um, I, I really appreciate it reading this and seeing all the things that it covers in here it, it addressed a lot of my concerns including one saying that you know you this would not be used for live monitoring unless there was like a riot or something going on which i'm hard to imagine that, that happening uh, down here but but that that gives me a level of of comfort as well because it's like no somebody is not going to be sitting watching this live this is really just going to be used as you said when there's some kind of Something, it, it, some action has you know, taken place, either a, as you said, a criminal complaint or an insurance claim or a lawsuit or whatever. So, um, to me, this just made a lot of sense then as a way to get more information for the borough in those situations, so we can know what really happened. What could, is this something that could conceivably be used? Suppose, suppose there's some some act of serious vandalism that does a lot of damage to borough property. Is that something where you would feel you, you could use this footage to, to sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, the uh, the recordings, most of the systems have a 14 day overwrite. You can actually extend it to a 30 day overwrite. You record that, you download it to a thumb drive, you investigate if you have a situation where there's criminal mischief inside any portion of where that's covered, um, and it helps with the investigation. With our patrol investigators, we can identify that person and submit a criminal complaint once we establish probable cause. So certainly I, I think that there's a lot of benefit with camera systems for investigative uses in law enforcement. There's no question about that. And what, um, I'm sorry, just want to finish on that, Paul. Uh, yeah, what Burr staff have been doing and what the Public Works Department who finds most of these instances have been asked to do by me and the chief is to, you know, talk to the police and make the police aware of it in terms of filing, you know, an official uh, complaint so they can document and investigate it. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to apologize if you answered this by stepped out. But in 4D, it says that the designated me will there will be a procedure um, for request form or other forms uh, once a request comes in to review the video. Who, who would have the ability to request that video? In other words, if I said, like, Chief, I want to see if my son was really at the skate park, that's not something that you would do. Um, or would you say, it's an attorney, like, is it an attorney associated with a case? Like, who, who actually can come in and under what circumstances can a person request to see that video? Yeah, and I think that's exactly the exact sort of things that needs to be um, tweaked and fleshed out more. And I think there's a good conversation for me and the chief and the borough solicitor. Um, yeah, yeah I, don't. I, I would really only be comfortable with if it's part of a deposition or an investigation. Like a citizen can't come and say, I'd like to see that video. I think as long as it's considered a police right. video, and I think we need to make clear that this mm -hmm. isn't borough borough government video, this is a police video, okay. then it becomes a police records. Then it would just be like you know, the national or, or their, their, their body cameras. And there are laws on the books that say that, that it's not subject to rights okay. okay. And that the retention, like it, they, that there are retention requirements, but I think they have 60 days in order to request the video after the, the event. Uh, so it's favorable taking into consideration massive data that it will take to retain videos Absolutely. and privacy laws. So as long as it's kept as a police video, obviously they would be subject to subpoenas if it's the case, course. but it wouldn't be something where someone would have the right to come in to demand a video, just like they would demand a public record. Okay. So I would just ask that we be really specific with that, that it is a police video. That's a great idea. Also, to take into consideration, it could be a civil matter that's involved with uh, police sentences. We may respond to a medical emergency there for a slip or fall or injury. Document that our record management system, and now we want to go back and we want to confirm what we have reported to us on video to see if that's there, because ultimately it could end up in a, you know a lawsuit, and uh, you know, and it could go from there. So you know, we may have involved in something in things that are, are not criminal. They could be they could be civil. The physical monitoring equipment is located in the police station, right? The monitors will be in the police station. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other concerns about the, the language? All right. So, I mean, it sounds like we generally approve of the language that's in here. We need to see more detail on the, the policy for um, who has access to the videos. Yeah, what we'll Once do is yeah, me, and, uh, me and the chief and the solicitor can get together and actually hammer out an actual Narber policy, which we could then, uh, you know, introduce, uh, you know, for, for more formal counsel consideration. Okay. And, and if the, the company has a True, suggestion, that's a great call, a good yeah. suggestion from the chief. Mm -hmm. Just to, be, to be clear, I, you, at the beginning of your remarks, chief, you mentioned that you were taking, you said the 20th? There's, is that June the big, What, I'm sorry? June 10th. Yeah. What? Yeah, did you say that? I'm sorry. You said that the cameras are at least the cameras that we had authorized, like the full security cameras that we had <laughs> authorized back in December or November when it was. Okay, so that because the video surveillance system will start. Yes. The infrastructure will start getting built on on Monday the 20th. Okay, so the whole thing is in now. What, the, the, they, were, they were waiting for some cameras, right? Oh, everything's in. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, let's move on to 12D, which is uh, the skate park hours. So uh, Google says that the sun went out at 831. Uh, and I will say on the first day, Michelle was in the park, this is a it was painful. It was magnificent <laughs> weather. Um, I've been trying to pop by every day. I think you have as well. Yeah. I mean, 7 o'clock, prime after dinner skating time, and to shut those doors just feels cruel. So I appreciate Mr. Bordeaux bringing that to our attention. And could we propose an 8.30? I mean, Chief, what, maybe you could give some feedback on what you've seen too, but uh, I, I would suggest maybe 8.30 or? I'll be glad to weigh in on this one. Uh, I'm all for it, and I'll tell you why, for a couple different reasons. Um, we haven't had any calls this week since uh, June 3rd, Friday, June 3rd, 
for kids on skateboards hanging up at 201 say by Do you have any calls for kids hanging over at the station circle or underneath the railroad trestle? We haven't had any calls for kids hanging out in the parking lot over behind the post office. Mm -hmm. So this skate park has basically <laughs> corralled. <laughs> they basically corralled this. And now the kids are on great behavior. Officer Dan Button was posing for them with a photo last Friday. They were well behaved. They haven't given the officers any, any, any trouble whatsoever. We were anticipating complaints about loud music. Some, not much. Um, that has happened. In addition to that, we were com concerned about drug use. We have received no such complaints about that during the past week. I'm not saying it won't happen, but what I'm saying is if this is a, uh, if this is a testing phase, a pilot phase, for the past seven days it's going pretty well. Um, and it, it's actually starting to have a collateral benefit effect on, on, on you know, basically calls regarding juveniles, disorderly crowds in the rest of the borough. So uh, uh, listen, I'm all for it. I would like to say let it let it stay open until dusk, uh, because there is no doubt in my mind that this is seeing uh, a lot of a lot of strong benefits already. Uh, and I think we could call it audible if things change uh, you know, throughout the summer. If you know maybe if it is causing problems where we are seeing that, but as of right now, I can tell you that what we've seen so far, and I'll I'll, I'll take I'll take a little bit into a personal step too. So I've gone out there and I, I've watched during the day. I've actually looked at the uh, working late, looked at the activity in the evening. I haven't seen any problems at all. Uh, you know, they, they all seem like they're well behaved. They're having fun. They're interacting together. They're they're getting exercises. And the other th thing to take into consideration is some kids are just not interested in baseball. Some kids are just not interested, obviously, in basketball. They don't want to be involved there. They don't want to be on the field with the soccer ball. Their hobby, their obsession, is skating or skateboarding, uh, and this is this is obviously something that I've seen for the past week that has been a benefit so far. But it change, sure, anything could change. It's unpredictable, but so far it's been pretty good. Obsession is the right word. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> yeah. I they'll they'll be back on the steps outside the skate park at some point. They, you know, yeah. you just. Yeah, so everyone's got to fly down steps. I don't know what it is. <laughs> suggestion of the dusk hour, and I know that we when we had that discussion about closing the parks at dusk. We had a whole lot of back and forth about it. But I'm looking at the sun, the sunset chart for the summer, and until July 12th, dusk happens to be at 8:30. When does the pilot? When's the time frame for the pilot end? Until it's too cold to skate. And it's too cold. So, yeah. so it's July 12th it becomes 8:30, and then by by the end of July it's 8:15, and then it starts pulling back, goes faster and faster. But so, could we use dusk rather than trying to adjust? Because if we say 8:30, it's going to yeah. already be too late by the end by mid July. And the lights, yeah. to clarify, the lights from basketball courts do not carry over onto the tennis court. Yeah. Okay, it's a skate park. Okay, so just. I would just want to make sure that it's closed at dusk. I mean, I don't want it to be open at night. I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, Who physically closes so. it? Like an officer? I think, yeah, I think officers have been. No, we are going to have to take that into consideration. There, if there is just one little, uh, one little problem we've seen this past week. Sometimes the officers are on a radio call. Sometimes the officers are doing a foot patrol, a vehicle investigation. We might not be there at that time. We may have to loop the house men in a little bit more with this closure because I was getting some texts with the mayor this past week, and rightfully so, because she, because she was getting complaints and concerns about the skate park being open past seven. And I basically had to say, officer so-and-so was on a radio call. We could be on a radio call if it could last for an hour. Um, so, and we, you know, so this could, that could be the one thing that we have to discuss, discuss about, uh, about that transfer of responsibility. And then we would be the backup because as of right now, we did hit some headwinds with some other responsibilities that we had that basically prevented us from getting there when we wanted to be there. Yeah, because if, it, if it's yeah, 7 o'clock right. closing and then it takes till 8 to close mm -hmm. down, that's one thing. But if it's 8.30 closing and it doesn't get closed till 9.30, then kids are in the dark. Is there a reason why the houseman can't close it? Uh, you know, I, I think we I think we all work together as a team pretty well. We could have this conversation. I, I wouldn't anticipate any problems with it. Great. Great. Yeah, totally great. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to vote on this or anything, so is this something that we could announce to the community? Well, let's finish this. So everyone's, uh, so we're talking about 
changing it to dusk? Is there anyone opposed to that idea? Okay. No, just, I mean, as long as we don't think that there's a complication in sort of ascertaining when, it, it's a shifting, it's a shifting yeah. closing time. And See, as long as there's somebody who's sort of like authorized to say, like, yeah, well, it's yeah. dark. If you look at the sun chart, if you look at the sun chart, June 30th, it's 830. July 30th, it's, it's um, sorry, June 30th, it's 830. July 30th, it's 815. August 30th, it's already seven, around 730. I mean, and it's going to be a determination of the officer on duty. Okay. I, I have to see it today. That's I, kind I, of I it's just the general sense. It looked like he was actually sweeping something up on the board, too. It's what we locked it up to, so you're getting some extra service from uh, the police. But the officer's going to have to be there <laughs> yeah. to lock it up. So if, when his determination is to. to well, or. So, so like, the judge switch responsibilities. I will say this, too. It is, it is kind of a. Yeah, I mean, we almost felt bad this past week, you know, when we were there at seven, telling the kids that they're going to have to leave and the weather's still nice. And then, you know, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I did actually, in all seriousness, I did say this to Officer Dutton because I think it's an awesome opportunity for yeah. kids to interact with police. Mm -hmm. I, I do hate that you're always the bad people shutting them down. If you could, logistics aside, just for kind of community relationships, Say it's the house person's rule to lock the door, and police officers. I mean, Officer Dutton in there chatting with the kids was awesome. Like, come in and chat with them, but don't always be the heavy. I, I actually like that policy and procedure for cultural reasons. Yeah, yeah, that's a better. I agree. Well, I like the idea too of, um, and uh, this was actually something that came up recently uh, that I was thinking of is maybe if the officer had time or the house and had time to go back and you know let let them know, hey, listen, we're going to be closing this in a little while. You know, not to, not going up and doing a shut the door approach. You know what I mean? Just to, just kind of give them forewarning. Mm -hmm. We're going to be closing this yeah. in a little bit. So think about yeah. packing up, and if you have any garbage, you're thinking about. That. And I will say this: <laughs> to add, they have left no trash. That's all. <laughs> that is great. They have been asked. That's so cool. They really, they're really excited about having this skate park here, and they don't want to blow it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they probably would monitor really their own closing and going home. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm saying, no, I'm not saying we should leave it that way, but just that it, they might create a culture themselves of yeah. knowing, like, hey, it's time to go. By, anyway, so by, by the time we get to <laughs> September 20th, <laughs> yeah. just That's for 7 o'clock. So well, at least all the summer. Yeah, a lot of us. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Is this going to be, when is this going to be effective? As soon as we can change the sign? <laughs> I mean, you can go and make it effective and then, you know, and then, yeah. I mean, we'll just update the sign as soon as we can. Yeah. Duct tape that sign. Oh, Instagram. Yeah, I'll talk Sharpie to Jeff. Marker. I'll talk to Jeff tomorrow morning about it. Okay. And then, yeah, then we'll coordinate with the house and all that. Okay. That's great. All right, next item is uh, comments for the good of council. Anyone have any comments? All right, seeing none, uh, we're going to convene to executive session to discuss a property and legal matter, uh, the Pureco lease uh, renewal terms, and a personnel matter of uh, the manager bonus. Uh, and we will not uh, return after the executive session. So, thank you, everyone. No, we have to uh, adjourn the meeting. So oh, wait, yes, we do. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning the meeting? Okay. Meeting is adjourned.